why is inertial mass not understood as it stands? It's always been assumed. So ever since Newton said, or, or Galileo before him, that things tend to keep going in straight lines until you push on them, it's it's almost been just language. There's been no mechanical model for it. So in my opinion, I've provided the first mechanical model for inertial mass to explain why things keep going in straight lines. Mm. And the flip side of that, I guess, is why do they stay still when they're, you know, why is it difficult to move something that's at rest, essentially? Yes, but as, as relativity uh, teaches us, the, the velocity is, is not, does not really matter. It's, um, it, it's, it's meaningless, really, to talk about a speed, because it's a speed relative to, to what? Yeah, well, so, to something else, I guess. It's difficult. Yeah, I guess yes. motion doesn't yeah. make sense without at least two bodies, right? That's right, yes. So that's l like Max Principle, isn't it? Mm, yes, Max Principle. Love it. We love Max Principle. Uh, I'd be curious to get into that. I remember I was having a conversation with my brother, and he's a computer programmer, and I was trying to explain to him the idea of inertia through Max Principle, and I explained to him what Max Principle was, which is that, I mean, it's, it's interconnection. On a fundamental level. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess like in, in Mach's words, it's more just that things far away affect things that are, like the entire universe affects. What's happening here? And I told him that and he's like, that sounds crazy. And I was like, I, 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 it's a named principle. And we looked it up and I think that it wasn't, wasn't it Einstein who formulated it? Well, Einstein drew heavily upon it, I guess, from what I understand. I'm not an Einstein scholar by any stretch, but a but, lot of people have drawn on it, right? And I don't, I don't think Mach called it Mach's principle or anything like that. But, but I think that's right, and it's quite vague as well. Right. But I, I'll, I'll try and explain how I think I have the first theory that incorporates it. Um, Mach had this this famous. Uh, it was actually Newton who, who started it with the Newton's bucket, where you have a spinning bucket. And the um, the surface of the the water becomes concave, and he argues that's not because of its motion relative to the side of the bucket, but relative to its it's just responding to its motion relative to the rest of the cosmos. But Mach had the famous question: What would happen if instead of rotating the bucket in the cosmos, you rotated the cosmos around the bucket? And that there is no theory which could explain what would happen or predict what would happen in that case. But my, my theory does explain that. What's the difference between rotating the bucket or rotating the cosmos? <laughs> Is there a difference? Well, uh, well, it was it was unknown. But what I predict is that when you start rotating the bucket, uh, sorry, the cosmos around the bucket, the bucket will will rotate with it, which is. A newly predicted effect, and I actually have some empirical evidence for that in the flyby anomalies, which are spacecraft passing by the Earth. Hmm. And it turns out that if they if they leave on the equator, they have a different behavior than if they leave close to the spinning pole. And I can predict that, and that that's a direct observation of Mach's principle, in in my opinion. Can you elaborate on that? Well, it's it's probably difficult to do it before I explain the theory itself. Okay. Well, so let's let's do that. Do you have? You said that you wanted to pull up a slide. Yes. Okay. I'll I'll share a screen. <clears throat> so, the idea is that we have this ball here, this black ball, and we assume it's accelerating to the right. So this way, mm. and according to quantum mechanics, when anything accelerates it sees a kind of radiation, which is called Unruh radiation, proposed by Bill Unruh from Canada in about 1976. And I've shown this radiation with the red color, and this radiation pushes on the object. It uh, hits it from all directions. Mm. But also, according to Einstein, from this area on the, the left, this black area... The non-radiating side. Or non-radiation yes. receiving side. That that's right. This object will never know 
what's in this black area because information travels at the speed of light. So accelerating to the right, information from this area will never catch up to it. So there's a, a kind of shadow zone here and a horizon separating it from the, the rest of the universe. The, the new thing I'm suggesting is that this horizon damps the Henri radiation in just the same way as if it was a Casimir effect occurring between the object and the horizon. So I've shown that with the blue here. Can you explain yeah. Casimir effect for us? Yes. The, the Casimir effect from physics is if you have two parallel metal plates and you place them within a micron or so of each other, then the, the quantum waves that are usually ubiquitous in space everywhere cannot fit between the plates. So that means there are more quantum waves outside the plates than inside. So there's a net force inwards pushing the plates together. And that has been observed in the lab. Do the plates have to be charged? They don't have to be charged, but they do have to be conducting. Uh, so what's happening is the electrons are moving within the plates and cancelling the, uh, the quantum fields, creating a sort of... Um, uh, a super vacuum, if you like, between the plates, which sucks them together. Mm. And is, th is this distinct from the way that current carrying wires attract? Yes, this is, this is a quantum effect. And although some people claim it is a van der Waals force, a van der Waals attraction, there's a bit of a debate about, about it. Mm. But I'm assuming it's a quantum effect and that the same effect occurs whenever you have an accelerating object and a horizon. So you see in the picture, there's more red on this side of the, the ball. So it gets hit more from this side than from this side, and it gets pushed back against its acceleration. So this provides a model for inertial mass. And if you calculate it, you, you get a result close enough, given the uncertainties in the calculation, to exactly predict inertial mass, what we see as inertial mass. So it's like a, a photon pressure. There's a shadow from the photon pressure. I guess yes. the photon pressure itself is the inertial resistance in this model. That's, that's right. Although okay. I now have a, a different way to, to derive it using information. But that's another story. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I, I guess the ubiquity of photon pressure is is really curious, right? Like everywhere you would go in the universe, you're going to be receiving light from somebody and it's going to put a slight pressure on you. What about gravity though? Because I, I always think about gravity as being uh, the opposite side of that because just as you're getting pushed on by different atoms, you're also getting tugged on by the same atoms. 